So glad that you guys made it. Uh, my name is Abby Lehman with L3, Ge L3 Harris Geospatial. If I haven't mentioned it's informal yet, it's informal. <laughs> uh, and I'm streaming to you straight from my home in Oakland, California. And this is the first episode of Geospatial Distancing. The official goal of this series uh, is to discuss the ways that remote sensing can be used to monitor the COVID-19 um, virus and how it's impacted the world around us. Unofficially, these are much more informal. Um, it's a weekly panel discussion over video uh, with members of the geospatial and remote sensing community at a time when everybody seems to be sheltered in place, right? And we wanted to provide an outlet. Um, we wanted to provide an outlet for informal conversations, the kind of stuff that people are already talking or were talking about at conferences, trade shows, and honestly, just leaning over cubicle walls. Uh, so we wanted to provide an outlet for that. Now, for those of you that have attended webinars by my company in the past, I'm sure that my face and my name are absolutely not familiar. That's because our usual webinars carry an air of mm, professionalism and they're hosted by someone that's actually quite good at it. I'm not that person. Uh, and this is not a usual <laughs> webinar. So here we are. The good news is, fortunately for me, I have two panelists today that are amazing. Um, they're two of the smartest women that I've ever met. Uh, and they have a really good, they have a talent really for speaking in front of an audience, whether it's remotely or in person. So our first panelist that I want to introduce is Megan Gallagher. She works with me at L3 Harris. Uh, she joins us from her home office in Lakewood, Colorado. Although she originally came from California, so it's not so surprising that her fascination with watching earthquakes from space is what drove her to go into the remote sensing game. Megan carries alumni status from the Colorado School of Mines and the Boise Center Aerospace Lab at Boise University. Key points on Megan. One, she is obsessed with SAR data. She also once went on a mission to attempt, attempt, to track down King Arthur's burial site using no, 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 ground penetrating want. radar or GPR for you other uh, travel channel geeks like me out there. <laughs> and lastly, she's just so damn likable, which makes her great. So say hello to the audience, Megan. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hope your day is going pretty well. So one more now. We have got uh, Ms. Amanda O'Connor from Teledyne Brown Engineering. She's joining us from her home office in the Boulder Foothills. Her work supports the DSIS mission, which of course carries the cool factor of, you know, doing anything in space. <laughs> she's also University of Colorado alumni, and she's what I consider to be one of the NB and IDL OGs. Uh, her obsessions, and these are her key points, hyperspectral data, compute power, and data fusion. Her scientific ventures have taken her to bizarre locations and bizarre dive bars around the world, where she actually perfected a pretty solid version of uh, karaoke Hey Jude. She's also most likely to have a cat walking behind her. During our there time. he is. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello, Amanda. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to talk to you guys today. And last but not least, before we dive in, I want to introduce my marketing colleague, Matria Grazing. She's coming to us uh, from her bootstrap home office in Broomfield, Colorado. Say hello, Matria. Hello. So Matri is going to be monitoring your questions as they come in for the panel. Uh, remember that you can absolutely ask, submit questions, and we encourage you to do so uh, using the Q&A button along the bottom of the Zoom screen right there. And Matri is going to be watching for that. So let's dive in. First thing we're going to talk about, we want to start by talking about pollution levels around the world, which obviously have fluctuated throughout the pandemic just because of the lack of human interaction with the environment around us. Um, and I'm gonna start with Megan because she was looking at a few examples of how it might be used. Uh, you wanna start us off? Yeah, totally. Uh, thank you for the introductions, they were lovely. And Amanda's cat had the perfect timing of jumping up right when you said that sentence. Uh, yeah, no, he's, uh, he was sleeping before. <laughs> he just knows. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about something that I've been finding pretty interesting, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have been hearing about this, and that is the report that the water in Venice has been clear lately, because Italy has been in lockdown for quite some time, and so we're actually hearing that, you know, the, the canals are clear, 
you're able to see wildlife. If you heard that you could see dolphins in Venice, I'm sorry to say that was incorrect. That was an entire another city. But there is still some pretty cool stuff that we can look into into it. And so, you know, wanting to see if we could see that with remote sensing, I got some planet data. And I'm just going to share that with you guys right now. Bah. All right. So here is a lovely planet scene of Venice from last year, uh, March 12th-ish. Actually, exactly March 12th in 2019. And uh, Amanda, have you been to Venice? Have you been to? Yeah, yeah. So you can see the main canal. That's the S. And then um, there's a big uh, kind of gap and a little S-shaped island to the south of Venice. And uh, that's Geodeca. Nice. And I mean, this is this looks normal. You know, lot, lots of boats, lots of shipping happening here. And then you can see a couple of the land surfaces pretty close. Just like if I zoom out here, we're able to see some deeper water, some areas where the other islands are. And then we can take a look at uh, this year. So this is from the 18th. And let me just sort of do that again. One, one minor difference you might notice is uh, there are no boats at all in here. And so, you know, looking for pollution to start off with to say, can I see clear water? The first thing I actually noticed was there's not much happening here. And that can lead to a lot of other things, such as sort of getting an understanding of the economical impacts here and probably in a lot of other cities around the world. But you can actually get some kind of information. So I've never been to Venice, which is a shame. So I can't say for certain, you know, is this good? Is this bad? What's changed and what's not? And that's sort of the, the thing about remote sensing is you actually need to know what you're looking for before you actually can find it. Because I'm sure Amanda I can go on for a, like, we, we both have a ton of stories on, yeah, you can torture those pixels as much as you want, but you're never actually going to be able to, you'll, you'll get information. But is that the information you need or does it even mean anything? And so I'm going to go to the person that has actually been here. You know, Amanda, what do you think about the difference between last year and this year? I mean, again, you, you notice the ships, obviously. Um, you see some different features in the lagoon. So remember, Venice is a lagoon. So I would say, you know, with the water clearing, you are seeing less of the turbidity of the boats and the big cruise ships that are really churning up, um, you know, the sand on the bottom. Um, of the water. So, you know, from a bathymetric perspective and trying to under, understand the lagoon dynamics, which are kind of important since uh, Venice has like high water seasons, um, this is an opportunity really to study um, the floor of the, um, of the lagoon, either with, uh, you know, a bathymetric LIDAR or other imagery to get a better understanding of what the current condition is because um, that's not an opportunity you would have otherwise if, if, if the traffic were, were still at the same level that it is. Um, so here would be an opportunity where you know there's change. We don't know what's happened in the past, but moving forward we can study, okay, as, as shipping and transit gradually come back on board, how does that actually change uh, the, uh, the new landscape that we're seeing here? And I think related to that, we have, I think this is the image, Amanda, or was it a separate one about the uh, Hasn't population? Popped yet. Oh. oh, I'm sharing a specific screen because it's, it's uh, super fancy. Let me see <laughs> if I can grab the other one. Very informal, you guys. <laughs> there we go. Um, and this, you know, a little bit different from the pollution topic. Um, this is actually a, a composite I put together with Landsat a couple of years ago when Ebola was was breaking out. And what I did, um, we knew the human, again, in a si similar situation, the human is the vector for Ebola, and we know that close contact, um, obviously you need to have very, very close contact with Ebola. I mean, the mechanisms are a little bit different, but um, this is uh, from Monrovia and some of the hardest hit areas with Ebola. And what I used was actually NV tools to try to um, isolate areas that um, had higher densities of population. So, uh, and you can, 
you can use that uh, to determine where you're most likely to have um, disease impacts because people are going to be closer together in those areas. And so this is just using the texture of, of Lanta data and it's pan sharpened to 15 meters. So you can see even at 15 meters, um, especially in impoverished areas where there's very close um, dwellings together, like where areas are, are better or worse. Um, and then, you know, retroactively, I mean, I think what COVID gives us an opportunity is to kind of, it, it's, a, it's a change detection in action. It's like, we can look at the cities that are, uh, you know, think about the favelas in Brazil or, um, you know, the, the close living quarters that are in India and look at correlating outbreaks with, um, you know, the human geography in these areas and how similar that is. Um, so to me, we have an opportunity now to start planning what imagery do we want to collect so we could make that kind of study um, so that researchers could say, you know, we, we collected, um, you know, worldview data um, is 11 by 11 kilometers. I mean, it's not that big. So if you're wanting to really target and get high resolution, you have to make plans to do tasking. Um, and the same thing with like my, the sensor I support DSIS, it's, um, you know, it's a 30 kilometer by 30 kilometer footprint. And we can still see textural um, evidence like this, but I need to plan where I'm going to collect data so that after this is over, I actually have something to compare to. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Meg. <laughs> yeah, it's always, I think the hardest part about remote sensing is you actually need to, like I said, you need to know what you're looking for. And that can be problematic because then you need to know like what kind of sensor will actually pick up those details like in the, the planet data I was just showing. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, does there exist the ideal sensor to be able to track any of this stuff? Because obviously there are, mm -hmm. and Megan was alluding to, limitations on being able to track things like a pandemic, you know, with remote sensing. Is there such a thing as the perfect sensor for something like this? Uh, Megan, not you want to take a whack or you want me to take a whack? I, I can go first and then you can, okay. you can fill in all the blanks that I'm going to about <laughs> to give freely and openly. I would say not yet. Like you combine a bunch of sensors, so we can talk a little bit more later about like more about pollutants because Amanda knows a whole ton about them. But if we're like looking at Venice with that planet data, if I wanted to actually get some information out of that, I would need to do like a turbidity study or some other stuff. And I don't have the bands for that with planet. I do get the revisit period, which means I can see it through the clouds, which is fantastic. And I can see the change, but I don't have enough bands to actually get it out into the nitty gritty. If I had a hyperspectral sensor, I'd be able to pull out that kind of information and actually say, oh yeah, it might actually be clear. But then, you know, revisit period, clouds, there's a whole bunch of different things that can affect it. And so I would say, no, there's no one sensor that can pick up on like atmospheric pollution changes and also things like social movement and that kind of stuff. It's more of, you need to find the right sensor for the right job, which is yeah. always, always a bit fun. <laughs> Yep, I, actually, if you look back in our EAS archives, I think I did um, a workshop on the right sensor for the right job. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I, I, I published the recording on that, so I can verify. I think you did, yeah. yeah. Um, just to add on to what Megan says, um, you know, obviously different sensors detect different um, kinds of information. So like uh, Sentinel-5 is really good for atmospheric information and looking at um, you guys have probably seen like the nitrogen um, images that have been on the New York Times and showing how there's lower nitrogen in the atmosphere in areas where there's been a, a decline in um, factory production. So that's a great sensor for that. Um, for looking at other types of like human geography, it depends on what you want to look at. If you want to look at an individual dwelling, you need a high resolution commercial sensor. Um, if you're looking at something else, um, I'm trying to think, if you're looking at uh, you know, wheat production in major parts of the world, then something like a Landsat or a Veers, depending on your scale, um, is, is really what you need. But um, somebody, somebody's note popped up and it said, it's all about phenomenology and I would 100% agree with that. Yep. I actually have a 
Yeah, Vanessa, do you want to get into the pollution thing first before I show my cool example of a sensor doing something amazing? Yeah, let's let's do the well. We talked a little bit about pollution. I guess the only thing I'd add on that um, with observing pollution in COVID is, um, you know, in talking to some of my colleagues, I've really been exposed to things that I didn't really think about in terms of pollution. Like I, at first I was like, oh, well, pollution should go down because people are not going out of their house or people are doing, you know, there's less factory action or other things, but then somebody pointed out, you can't bring your, you know, reusable coffee mug to Starbucks, you have to get a cup or you have to buy a reusable bottle of water, or you can't just fill it up. So from, you know, a micro pollution scale, um, I think we're probably increasing the amount of, of litter and trash that we have. And we all know sometimes that ends up in waterways and bad places. And then, um, but at the same time, you have fewer vessels that are maybe making the Pacific Transit um, for fishing and that type of thing, uh, because there has to be a little bit more prep with COVID because you can't, you can't field a crew on a big sea vessel who have not been quarantined because if you put one guy on there or gal who's sick, then you know, you're, <laughs> you're gonna have a bad trip. Um, so it may be that there's fewer discarded nets going into the ocean. So there's, I think there's some puts and takes that are gonna happen with pollution um, for, um, for COVID. And I think that, again, that goes back to planning and thinking about what are the, the secondary impacts? You know, we have, you know, wonderful doctors who are, are, are helping people immediately. And there's also a vast amount of, of, of medical waste that's being generated and typically incinerated. Um, but there's areas that I didn't think would be impacted by COVID from a pollution or a a trash perspective that are happening in a way that um, I didn't expect. And I think if we put some thought to that, that we can get now is the before. Now is, you know, that we're all quarantined is the before time to get images of New York City without that many people around or to get images of places where there's typically, you know, you would never see the ground because of there being too many people, cars, et cetera and get that before and then try to get the after when the quarantine is breaking before things absolutely resume. And it just really can help understand, um, you know, the impacts of this illness that we, we didn't really think were gonna happen. And we were at a unique moment of being able to study um, what pandemics can do to our earth. All right, I've labored enough. Thank you. Right, I'm gonna Good question to kind of chime in here um, from the audience. So um, since human activity is an, at an all-time low, can we use data being collected today as a baseline for assessing and measuring human activity in the future? And then kind of a follow-up question to that is what types of human activity could we observe and measure in the future using today as a baseline? Ooh, those are, yeah, those that's are really good. Go ahead, uh, Megan. No, I'm just, uh, th those are just really good questions. Yeah. Like you, would, I, Gosh. So, I mean, if you can find the dates of when, like, specific places have had, like, the full stay-at-home lockdown, you could probably get, like, population movement change. Because I know in the United States, we have that, we actually have, like, a social distancing grade scale that's going out. And that's not using remote sensing particularly-ish. It's more of using, like, GPS stuff. But you could probably get a baseline for things such as like movement in total, if you have really high resolution stuff, you might even be able to get to be down to a much larger scale. But on a bigger scale, I actually have a cool, I'm going to show my article now because it's still really cool and it's SAR, so I'm allowed to be really excited about that. Like tracking merchant fleets is a really big thing and that's something that's coming up a lot right now. And so this example is actually done, this was by like the, this article is by the New York Times and it's about how we were tracking uh, North Korea's merchant ships and so we tracked them using SAR, which is why I'm so excited about it. But because of the coronavirus, they're all moving back to North Korea. So we're tracking their movement and we can have a baseline for what exists there. And we can even do things like counting or getting proper numbers for things while they're all sitting and stable. And then we can go forward from that and build off of that as well. And so for uh, North Korea officially says, I believe that they haven't had a single case. 
well, we'll leave that where it is, but they are recalling everything back. And so now we actually have an opportunity to sit and see what is going on with a lot of different sensors to bring out this information. And so that's, merchant fleets are something that I think would be pretty easy to watch during this time period, especially anything to do with the ocean. Cause like Amanda said, there are, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with things such as shipping and actually airplanes too. That's a big thing. It's a, uh, we're actually losing out on weather data because we don't have a lot of airplanes that are flying around right now. And those are actually used for weather modeling. And so we're actually losing a lot of data at the moment, which will be interesting to see, especially for us in Colorado, who always get random snowstorms in April and May. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, One's starting now. <laughs> I'm trying to ignore it. <laughs> Amanda, do you want to address that question at all yourself? Uh, yeah, I mean, if we take now as a baseline, as some of the lowest human factory production in, I, I, I don't know what if, whether I can say history or not, but at, this is a point where we're at some of the lowest production. Um, certainly atmospheric data throughout the world should be collected and then look at the increase to better understand our air quality and the impact of fossil fuels and other, um, other things that are going to be released in the atmosphere when uh, the economy starts to rev back up. Um, I think, you know, Megan has a good point on looking at, at human activity and tying that into um, what gets started first, what, um, what happens now. Um, we're going to talk about this, and I guess we can talk about it now, the Russia thing or the um, yeah, agriculture. Um, right now is spring wheat planting time. So from a veer, like a large scale perspective using something like a veers or a modus uh, where you're collecting over large areas, you know, you have spring wheat growing, going in right now in theory, but let's say we don't really know all of the COVID numbers. I don't think anybody does. And you can use that information of saying, okay, so we know spring wheat should go in now. We know in a couple months it should be emerging. We know a little bit while after that it should be starting to, to get bigger and measurable. So like the NDVI reports that get put out by beers and, no, um, and MODIS are something that you can use to actually, you know, kind of backtrack uh, to numbers of COVID. Um, you know, if you didn't have um, people to do the planning, if you didn't have people to run the machinery, if you had a shortage on fuel to run your tractor, if you didn't have all your supplies for seeding because of, um, because of supply chains, that type of thing. Um, so in a couple of months, I think if you use now as your baseline um, and then see what happens and then using historic data, you can actually compare, you know, what are, what are, what are our staple crops doing post COVID, especially in areas where we don't know the accurate COVID numbers. So that would just be another area where I would say you can start now looking at um, what would typically be happening at this time of year and, and then carry it forward in a couple of months, re-image that area so that you can understand um, some of these impacts. I mean, we know they're going to be there. It's just how they're going to manifest themselves. And I'm not sure that we all, we know that yet. So those are just a couple of examples. I mean, you give me half, <laughs> you give me <laughs> an hour so I can give you a ton more. So if that person wants to ask more questions, I'm happy to uh, respond. Same thing as Megan. Yeah. And then side note to that, which is, I think this is going to be a very interesting time if you try to do that kind of stuff to North America, especially like Nebraska. Yeah. Because last year at this time, we don't have very good data because everything was flooded. And so now we've exacerbated the problem from year to year because last year there was horrific flooding and people just, they weren't able to grow crops. And so we're going to see if we have a very long time scale, which you can do with like the, with MODIS and uh, VIRS, you're going to be able to see just exactly what kind of impacts the double whammy of years is about to have in a lot of places. And so that's something I personally am probably going to be keeping an eye on because like we said, we can monitor it and we have the opportunity to be actually prepared for knowing that something is going to happen. And so yeah. we can be prepared for what kind of outcomes are going to come from it with remote sensing. So I don't need to be in the field because I can't be, but I can still 
know what's going to happen and prepare myself and hopefully give it the information to the people who can use it. Yeah, and just, just one more comment on, um, on being able to observe differences in um, crop activity and, and growth. Um, you know, that's a major issue with food security. So again, we know there's certain areas of the world that are, you know, con unfortunately have a high level of conflict. Add in starvation, lack of food, that type of thing. Um, from, a, from a defense and intelligence standpoint, understanding the impact of COVID has on future harvest, I think is extremely important for understanding food security um, in areas that, that can be um, quite dangerous. So at least with remote sensing, we can observe that. And then with higher resolution sensors, whether it's spectral or spatial, still like the sensor I support DSYST is, um, you know, it, it's a hyperspectral sensor. It can tell you a lot about the health of a crop like does it need a nutrient like um, nitrogen or phosphorus or, or, or water or something like that. Again, you can also understand supply chain. So if you have seen a crop that's pr produced very well over the years, but then suddenly you're not getting the nutrients that you need for it, um, that would be pretty apparent in the specter of the data. Well, it seems like there's a lot for just precision ag in general. Um, yeah. I, actually, I just really just received breaking news actually that we officially have speakers for our next week conversation uh we'll actually be talking to one of my colleagues austin coates uh and micah sense someone from micah sense so Sweet. we'll have the chance to kind of go into that stuff a little bit more next week nice. uh did you, you guys have any other examples that you wanted to talk about or should we just move to q a i think those were the main ones yeah I think that's what's the main main ones we wanted to talk to. We, we, we said 15 minutes, but I think we've got a half hour. Yeah. So, it's fine, it's um, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, just a reminder, yeah. if anyone has any other questions that they want to ask, just use the Q&A button down at the bottom. Have we had any other chat stuff come through, Mott? Yep, not, so, not yet. Yeah. And I mean, I know that was sort of like a bit of a downer note right there. I mean, it was really informative, but the, the main thing that we're trying to say here is we can be prepared for a lot of stuff that's happening. If you know what you're looking for, if you are one of the people that's watching the North Korean fleet or you work with monitoring agriculture, you know, this is the time where you'll actually be able to be prepared for watching all the stuff that's going forward. And so that we can all, everyone here, can be ready and set forth for when things either clear up or when we know we need to go in and fix things. So actually a positive note, I'd like to say that we know what's we, we can actually know what's happening right now. So. Yeah, you don't get an opportunity with change detection very often. I mean, I don't know how many people have asked me. It's just like, well, can you tell what's changed between these two scenes? And it's like, well, I have the now scene, but we don't have the before. So um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so to me, it's like we're in the before time and we do have that opportunity to think about it, design some, um, uh, some research, do it well, plan for the data that we need to get and, and try to understand these impacts because I mean, unfortunately, these things probably will happen again. And the more we know about how our earth reacts to it, um, I think the better we'll be able to be prepared to um, be able to understand things that we should have, sh we should prepare for in the future. <laughs> um, so to me, this is, you know, from a researcher perspective, this is a, a time when I, I feel a bit overwhelmed on the things that we could possibly be anticipating are going to change. So that, you know, that would be my, my kind of encouragement to the crew is, is think about that question and ask yourself, you know, if you could study something um, that's related to this or where you think COVID is gonna make its mark on, its, on this earth, you have the opportunity to plan. And to me, that's, that's really exciting. And um, yeah, and I think Abby may have some comments. Oh, I always have comments. <laughs> you know but I am actually going to toss it over to Matria because I think that we have some questions that came in. We do. Uh, so the first question here, can we use sensors for identification of specific mineral content of humans or livestock? Megan, you want to take that? I am a bit confused by the question content itself. Do you mean like... Because there was that fake news article about the sulfur dioxide in China. Do you mean like the 
can we monitor the human emissions and in, in like animal emissions with remote sensing? Because if you're trying to get down to like the components of a human, I would rather suggest going to a doctor because they know more. Though they might have a hyperspectral sensor that can help you out. So I'm going to need a little bit more background on that one. Always thinking. Always thinking. <laughs> I think the only, I've had questions like this before. Um, just in terms of being able to observe like the health of like range cattle in a remote sensing environment. And typically it's been from a secondary source. You look at the, um, the rangeland vegetation and the overall, he overall health that that is in. Um, but as far as like mineral content, um, you need some sort of penetrating instrument, I think. Go to the doctor. <laughs> All right, let's jump to the next question here. Um, with the lack of pollution due to a decrease of human involvement, would this period of social distancing have an impact on world climate change? Potentially. I potentially it really it depends. I, I've I've read I've read it both ways that yes, you're you have a lower emission of um, you know of carbon dioxide and, and green, you know, greenhouse gases, that type of thing. But at the same time, you have people who are not working on those problems uh, because of, you know, forced to work from home. I mean, yeah, you may be a NASA scientist, but if you don't have your laboratory spectrometer in your living room, you can't necessarily be, be studying what you're studying. So there may be a gap of knowledge in some ways that we're losing here because, um, because of, you know, this, the shelter in place. The other thing is, um, you know, with the, the economic impacts, uh, there are a lot of solar farms planned, wind farms planned, alternative energy plan. Some of that is funded by venture capital, some of it's funded by others. Um, you know, everybody's pretty much, much taken a hit in the stock market. I think that there could be a slowdown in um, the production of things that um, could mitigate climate change. So th there's ups and downs on that one. Megan, do you have any additional thoughts on that? I mean, I think Amanda pretty much covered it. I don't, there will be an increase and a decrease in pollution, sort of like Amanda was talking about earlier. We just don't know how much is going one way and how much is going the other. Like you have, you can't use reusable bags. There's a lot of more takeout containers, that kind of stuff. And so I definitely think there will be changes, but I have no way to even understand what kind of changes will be occurring. So it's sort of really up in the air and something somebody should definitely be keeping track of somebody out there definitely that'd be a really cool thing to study i know megan and i are in the position of you know i support an instrument megan supports uh, software for remote sensing um you know we end up in this these kind of fields you end up being a jack of all trades master of none um so i encourage the people who really know this stuff <laughs> to look into it or, or come on as a guest next time um, on one of the future geospatial distancing. Yeah. All right, let's jump into another question here. Are there observations we can make with satellite data that could operate as a proxy for understanding the spread of COVID? For example, North Korea has reported no cases of that may not be the case. Are there sensors well suited to observe signatures that suggest COVID-19 spread? I think I will grab this one and do it in proxy of Amanda because she like literally sent me a news article on this this morning because that's what we like talk about. And yes, actually. So like you can use SAR to track merchant vessels. We know they're all going back to North Korea. You can use high resolution sensing to get an understanding of like parking lots being filled. Like if there's a hospital and the parking lot is overwhelmed with cars or that kind of stuff, then you're actually able to pick out that kind of information as well. For some other stuff, I'm not quite sure what sensor to use, Amanda, you might be able to fill me in, but you can look at like thermal imaging and you might be able to get like literal hotspots of like buildings that are very active. Maybe they weren't as active before. Once again, maybe looking at hospitals and those surrounding areas, looking at fields, uh, just looking at things people would normally interact with and seeing are they being interacted with a lot more or a lot less than they usually are. Would is able to just, you might not be able to get like that's exactly what's happening, but it starts to build up a pile of information that you can draw from and then actually pull out that kind of just like, all right, I can see that this hospital this time last year and, you know, following those trends, there were not a lot of cars in the parking lot, like a normal amount. And now this time this year, they're like 
on the streets and that kind of stuff, you can pull out that kind of information. So it just depends on what exactly you think will define that for you. Yeah, and then just to add on, I mean, North Korea is incredibly well studied by the US government mm -hmm. and there is much high resolution data over that area. So, um, you know, Megan picked out some really good things to take a look at um, as far as like, I think looking at emissions, um, previous emissions relative to now should give an idea of, of the downturn. Um, really good nightlight could be another yep. thing, although um, there, you, North Korea doesn't have too many nightlights <laughs> to begin with, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, there, there may be enough of a change to, to look at that. Um, I think probably looking at um, power plants, um, mm. there, there's a number of different indicators on uh, human population and I know a couple of different groups that study it that they have models for areas that don't have a census um, where they're able to say well if you have this input and this input and this input we would anticipate a population of X and I know I think it's I don't think it's called land trender it has a name no that's um, and I know the guy who does it um, so I'm pretty sure yeah, it's land trender it is land trender? I think so. The studying of like the series over time mechanics. Yeah, and well, this this was specifically for um, I. It was in um, one of the national labs because part of the national labs' job is to estimate how much energy a population needs. And if you have a population where you have no idea how many people are there because there's no such thing as a census, then oh, land scan. It. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Um, there are inputs that you can put, you can add like roads and buildings and, and other pieces to come up with a population and things like that could be reapplied to an area like North Korea to see if perhaps there would be a difference in, um, population between now and the before time. And then, uh, I think we have another question, Mott. We do. Um, presumably, Earth observation data could also be used as a value as valuable input to modeling the spread of pandemics from an environmental standpoint. What types of sensors would you see playing key roles in these types of assessments? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Sure. Presumably, Earth observation data could also be used as valuable input to modeling the spread of pandemics from an environmental standpoint. What types of sensors would you see playing key roles in these types of assessments? Is it rude of me to say all of them? <laughs> um, they, they do all have a point. I mean. Okay, I, okay, Amanda, here's a test. How would you use LIDAR? How would I use LIDAR? This is really, I, I, that popped in my head and I'm sorry, but. <laughs> um, I would, if you had like a global LIDAR and you had some sort of idea about like tree biomass and no, no, no. Oh, oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> there have been studies done that actually malaria flourishes in deforested areas. Ah. So when you pull the trees out, the water doesn't drain as well because you don't have anything sucking up the vast amount of water that's just getting dumped in the Amazon. So if you knew about, you know, how many trees were there, how many went out, you could potentially make a connection between that and malaria. That's just one disease. And that, that kind of brings up a good point. I mean, COVID, COVID's different. Um, you know, other diseases have different vectors. And, um, but that's how I use LIDAR. I, I actually wasn't expecting an answer. And now I'm just sort of surprised, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't COVID related. It was yeah. malaria related. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. It, it just said pandemics. So, yeah, that, that's the thing is each of these has such different ways of, like, spread. Because... I tend to take remote sensing as a very broad term, like cameras taking pictures when you do photogrammetry, that's remote sensing. And so like when you see the things of like, there was a cough test to show how far you would cough and why we need to stand so far away from each other, to me that counts as remote sensing. And so anything from using a UAV to like monitor road traffic or to see where people are still going where they shouldn't be, and, or to going to like these really, really high resolution centers like or excuse me, low resolution centers like MODIS, where we can have that full NDVI tracking over time. I think it, I think they all have a lot of valuable information you can use. 
depending on what kind of aspects of the pandemic you want to pick up and study. So it's a, I'm sorry, it's a very bad answer to your question, but I think it is just sort of what you're trying to focus on. Well, and one of the things we talked about earlier, looking at population density, obviously the closer you are to other people, the more likely you are to get a disease that's spread human to human. Um, the other example that I, I love for like medical geography is um, looking for thatched roofs mm. um, to look at the spread of hantavirus. That's more specific to the Southwest US and well, there's not so many th thatched roofs, but South America, it's, it's been studied and you know found a direct correlation of um, places where they need to change their roof type so they don't have uh, mice. Okay. Uh we are getting near uh, our time limit. Um, I think there was actually one quick clarification back on one of the questions, Matria, do you wanna address that? Yeah, so um, to follow up the question but the, um, before where we needed a little bit more clarification on using sensors for identification of specific mineral content of humans or mm -hmm. livestock. Follow up to that was um, not COVID related but in components of human composition. Um, I think it would be a good way to uh, remotely identify people or a specific breed of animal. I think the big thing about that is the resolution you'd have to have. Like if you have like an ASD sensor or something that's you know, very precise, we can use like hyperspectral to pull out information. But if you're trying to do it like from space or a UAV, the thing about like animals is they move around a lot. And not only are they moving, but a lot of them are very small. So it depends on what you're targeting. And I'm no expert um, this stuff. This is just me sort of trying to figure it out in my own head. But you're an expert. Come on. I'm not. The, Amanda is the hyperspectral expert. Let's be honest here. Oh, that, well, uh, but I'm just. I, those are the first things I think of could be problematic, and then I will hand it off to the expert to uh, <laughs> actually pull out the real information here. <laughs> so there are a couple things. Um, hyperspectral. I can't believe I'm about to say this. It depends whether you have fur or no fur. Um, <laughs> so, you know, from a skin perspective, you'd have to have a fairly high resolution sensor and you can tell blood oxygen levels because oxygen has an absorption feature with hyperspectral data, little known. Uh, actually, that is well known, but applying it to the human body um, is uh, there's been some studies about people using it for altitude sickness, like, you know, taking a small spectrometer, shining it on somebody's face and, um, and seeing whether, how much oxygen they have in their system and whether they may be at risk for um, altitude sickness. For, um, for identifying different kinds of animals, and again, this kind of gets into the fur, no fur thing, or how much fur, um, I would say a high resolution thermal camera is you're going to be your best bet because in theory, different animals have different body temperatures. Um, so with that, you could probably say, well, this is a cow and it's not a buffalo. Um, I'm trying to, this is a really interesting question. I know, I haven't really, because I think because most of the time when you're working with hyperspectral, you're usually working with like vegetation or uh, mineralogy and that kind of stuff. And so if you're going to like animals, that brings in the whole like catching them, how do you measure it? Like, well, someone, like has someone used hyperspectral on animals? Like, yes, is that I was actually just saying, I just saw in the chat, um, one of our attendees tried it over Afghanistan. Did you see that comment? Oh, and they did a... I missed it, sorry. They used Worldview 3 to differentiate between caribou and polar bears. That's awesome. How is it just like the size? I don't know. Whoever you are, that is fantastic. I have found a seal with um, aerial images um, <laughs> on an ice floe. <laughs> oh. um, one, one more thing, and what, this is like, you know, this is nano hyperspectral. We had... Um, when I was at L3 Harris, we had a customer who um, was doing cancer research. And when they, it, anybody who's been through, um, you know, a relative, friend, yourself, uh, cancer treatment, you hear something like carboplatinum chem chemotherapy, they really mean platinum. Like they're literally injecting you with, with the precious mineral. And so there was this group in Alabama that was um, actually using a hyperspectral camera on their microscope 
to look at cancer cell absorption of a gold treatment that they were developing. Um, and because everything had specific wavelengths, they were able to use that to test their success rate of the, the tumors uptaking um, the, the treatment in theory. So uh, that's at a very nano level and um, you know, probably a random fact for today. <laughs> You know, we actually had one more question pop up. It looked like a good one. Matria, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, when using machine learning or deep learning models to track changes in human activity, can you combine SAR images with optical images to get a more robust understanding of change? Megan. Megan, <laughs> SAR. It has, it has the SAR word. I, I keep passing the high perspective to you, so I guess I'll take this one. Um, yes, depending upon what you're trying to pull out. As, as we sort of had the theme of this one, uh, what you're trying to pull out of the information and what you're focusing on brings in which sensor you're using. And so if I was looking for boats on the water, I would definitely use SAR because it makes it a lot easier. But then if I wanted to actually figure out what kind of boats they were, like a, you know, a deep learning, or if I had a model of a bunch of different types of boats and I don't know different types of boats, so I'm not going to use any examples, I'm sorry. Um, but if I wanted to pull that out, I would probably also have optical imagery as well. And so if I did that for pulling out the boats and then going in and pulling out like what kind of boat it is, that'd be a pretty great example of using them both together and tying back into monitoring of the marine fleets at the moment as well. For things like, um, actually it's really good for NDVI studies. So if you are in the middle of peak season and you have a lot of fields that are surrounded by trees, sometimes you can have a lot of confusion between them because green and green. If you have SAR, you're actually able to get the uh, structural differences between most of the crops and the trees, depending upon what kind of crops they are. And so that would also aid in those efforts. But it really just does depend on what you're trying to pick up and if it is the proper use case to use both the optical information and then the sort of the uh, scattering information for the SAR sensor. And then you just need to make sure that everything within them is aligned and corrected correctly. But there are a lot of use cases where they can be used together. This has been uh, awesome, guys. This has been really fun. Yeah, well, it's nice <laughs> to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for people that are still with us, uh, you know, we'll definitely be doing this again next week. Um, I actually had Matria pull up um, uh, some web addresses where you can take it away, Matria. Share yeah, let me just see if I can remember how to share my screen. I also highly recommend following uh, Amanda on social media because she has a very happy presence there. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great social yeah. media. So, I would so here we can follow Amanda here. Um, she's at AAS O'Connor on Twitter. And then lastly, to make sure that you're able to keep in touch with us in regards to upcoming, I guess, episodes. I don't know what we want to call these. <laughs> um, <laughs> Here is our web address for our webinars. You can also just go to harrisgeospatial.com slash webinar. It's an easy way to remember. Um, but we'll have all the registration details and the recording from this episode available there for you. We'll get it up. We'll get it up right away because we get ready for the one next week. Uh, and like I said, you know, uh, looks like we're going to be talking to Austin Coates uh, and a guest from Mike Ascents next week, which is pretty exciting. Um, and I think that wraps it up for today. You know, thanks for sticking with us through our experiment. Um, it was a lot of fun. And before we sign off, just a few things. Uh, remember to say thank you to a doctor or nurse, should you happen to come across them, hopefully not more than six feet, unless you're in the hospital. Uh, generously over tip your delivery drivers right now. And ask yourself the question, do you really need to be hoarding all that toilet paper? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you guys have a good rest of the day. It's been fun. Thanks, everybody. This Thanks is great. You guys. Bye.